All right, good morning, everyone. Um, this is September the 18th, and we're going to continue on with our concrete um, lectures. Um, I think I'm still on the first set of notes and slides that we'll be going through. So uh, I know Wednesday we had a test, and we're going to go over those on Monday in uh, good detail. And then we will have a concrete lab Monday afternoon. So be ready for that. The lab reports for the course aggregate, uh, they won't be due until I return the first lab report. So you're probably looking at uh, at least Wednesday on those. So you have a little more time to work that out if you need to get with your group or um, ask any questions. It'd be a good time to do that on Monday. Okay, uh, we're going to pick back up right after the proportioning concrete mixtures. And that's actually what we were doing in class. And if we have any more extra time on Monday, I hope we will, I think we will, then we'll actually uh, get back to proportioning the concrete mixtures. And that'll be the, remember, that'll be the big question on the second test, on the, on the concrete test. So, all right, I'm going to um, share my screen with you. And you should be able to see that uh, there. Okay, so um, we haven't really got finished with the proportioning concrete mixtures or, or the mix design, but what you're going to see is that we can change the proportions by weight or we can change the water cement ratio. Um, you know, we can change several things like that. We might even be able to change the aggregate that we have, which would change the specific gravity. Uh, it, it's you know, a lot of experience comes in and uh, with the products that you're using and with the result that you're looking for. So, um, of course, these batch plants, you know, they've been doing it for years and they kind of know what's going on. Every now and then, and one of the last lectures we'll have in this series for this section uh, will be um, pervious. And, and so every now and then something new comes along and, and um, the good thing is we have like manufacturers associations and and uh, people that support the industry that help us with those things and those new technologies. But anyway, back to the notes. So all factors should be considered before, you know, finalizing mix design to make sure that the end result is what you're looking for. Uh, and we try to keep the price down as well. It's oftentimes a good idea to use trial batches. And that means, that, you know, just kind of like if you were testing different cake recipes, you just make a cake out of it and see, see how it does. And so we make a concrete mix, we make cylinders and we test it in various ways, depending on what we're you know, actually doing uh, and see how it comes out. See, um, see if it's strong enough, you know, see if it's durable enough or, or what, whatever the criteria might be. And then just like I said earlier, so you know, it's not an exact science. It seems like it might be, but it's not because things are constantly changing and materials are slightly different. So, you know, experience or human judgment are, are super important. The next uh, slide is on estimating and uh, we have a whole class on estimating so I don't feel the need to do um, a whole lot here and uh, I know we, we did a little estimating in chapter two on uh, calculating the amount of gravel for a road base or something like that. But basically it's just a volume calculation. Um, typically Rebar, and we'll talk about rebar later, but typically rebar is neglected. If you have a tremendous amount of rebar, it, you could factor in some, but typically it's neglected. Um, concrete is sold by the, they'll say yards. You, you'll hear people talk about even materials, they'll say yards, yards of concrete, but it's really cubic yards. Uh, the cubic is understood. Obviously yards is a linear measurement, so it's, it's a volume, uh, and that's how they're going to sell concrete if you were to call a batch plan or, or most people if you're talking about concrete. So you need to make sure your conversion is right and there's 27 uh, cubic feet in a cubic yard. And then lastly, uh, depending on the type of construction, you probably want to add a waste factor. Um, typically there are some waste and, and we'll talk about all the different types of construction. But just to give you an example of that, um, of course, testing would be one, and we're going to do some tests on Monday. That's minor uh, and shouldn't take all that much, depending on the specifications and how much testing you have to do, but it will take some. And uh, if you have a type of construction where you are not using forms, so, so steel or, or wooden forms, 
and you're letting the, um, let's say it's a foundation type of construction and you're letting the earth itself be the form, then, you know, how accurately really is that measurement? Uh, the same thing could be said about like a slab on grade or a sidewalk or something like that. We'll do a calculation for a sidewalk in a minute. Um, you know, how, how accurately can you control that, that depth or thickness? And so you're probably going to want to add some, um, like a, a waste factor or some added concrete. Your text says three to 8%. Uh, I've seen people use as much as 10% depending on the, on the project, um, but something a little extra just to cover. You don't want to run out of concrete. You always want to have too much. Uh, you don't want to leave yourself short because most of the time if that happens, you haven't, um, you're going to have to wait. I mean, it's not like an instant thing that you just say, hey, I'm putting more concrete right here. So you're going to have to call the batch plant. They're going to have to make arrangements. They got other jobs going on. Right now, we've got a project going on um, where concrete, and I don't know if this is COVID related, but it's, it's, it's difficult, uh, you know, to get. So they're backed up and, uh, you know, or maybe they have a problem at the batch plant. Maybe they have something break down. So my point is you don't want to run out. You want to make sure you overestimate slightly. So that's why people use as much as a 10% uh, overestimation. You know, a yard of concrete probably costs anywhere from, depending on what kind, you get 130 to 175 or $80. So to add even one more yard, cubic yard, which is a quite a bit of concrete, if you think about it, um, is, is not gonna be that much in the overall price of most of your projects, whereas running out is really gonna cause you some problems because then, like when we talk about finishing the concrete, you're gonna have that time lag and you probably could have some problems with finishing because some of it's already begin to set. Um, all right, so uh, I want to I want to go over like at least one calculation just for um, an estimation. And so uh, let's just say that the given was a sidewalk. And um, let's just say the length was, I don't know, say 100 feet. That's length. length. And let's just say the width was, uh, let's say four feet. And let's just say a thickness or depth of, let's just go four inches there, okay? And so once again, this is just the, uh, you might say volume required. That would be the fine, by the way volume required. And so we're just going to put these numbers together and we need to be consistent with our units. So we got 100 feet and then we've got uh, four feet in width. And then I'm going to just go ahead and this and convert. So four inches and then I've got 12 inches per foot. So I'm going to divide my uh, four by 12 or 0.333. All right, so let's see, what's that gonna give us? About 3,400, 133.333. And that's cubic feet, okay? And then uh, I'm just gonna say like with waste uh, factor. And uh, let's just say that we feel pretty good about our form work in this uh, calculation. And so I want to do a 5% waste factor. So this would be like uh, adding tax, you know. So what, what I would say is maybe the volume total would be equal to the 133.3. That's a repeating number. And that, remember, that's cubic feet. And then I'm just going to multiply that by 1.05 for the 5%. So still got my number in. That gives me right at 140.0 cubic feet. And then, which is also, and we'll take that number and what I'm gonna do with it is divide by 27 cubic feet in a cubic yard. And that's gonna give me five 
0.18 cubic yards of concrete. Okay, it's a little sloppy, but I think you get the uh, the gist of that. So, you know, the question might be, can you buy 5.18? They'd probably laugh at you if you were uh, calling the batch plant and order 5.18. So that 5% may end up going to five and a half or 6%. You know, you could probably order five and a quarter yards or definitely five and a half yards uh, of concrete just to make sure. All right, you got any questions on that? Estimation, so it's a volume calculation with a, a waste factor or a little bit of an overage depending on your type of construction. And we'll talk more about that types of construction. Uh, we got a whole set of slides for that. All right, so next is um, after the estimating is concrete manufacturing. And really uh, the first thing that your text covers is, uh, you know, the different mixing methods. If you've ever done anything with concrete, I, there's really nothing you can do with concrete that's easy just because it's so uh, heavy. And generally you're talking about a mass of concrete. So, you know, it's just hard to move around in general. But uh, mixing by hand, there's not a lot of people that do that anymore. And when, when I'm mean by hand, I really mean, you know, mixing up like in a wheelbarrow or something. Now, a lot of people, when you talk about quick creek, uh, obviously there may be a lot of people mix that by hand, but it's better to mix that in a, in a portable mixer as well. So I won't spend any more time on mixing by hand, but there's a, there's a lot of portable mixers that are used. Um, we have some in the lab. There's a couple that are set up over there and, and obviously they just have a rotating drum. There are different size. Uh, you know, they probably have them from a quarter of a cubic yard up to maybe even a, a full uh, one or I'm not sure if they have a two. Two cubic yards would be quite a bit, but uh, so those are, they have pull behind portable mixers. Um, they have the kind that once again, generally if they're portable, obviously they have wheels and so they're easy to maneuver around. And so that's something to consider if you're uh, for contractors that are, are actually mixing their own concrete. It, it's, it's really, uh, you know, when you're talking about either by hand or with a portable mixer, once you get up to even a, a yard of or more, let's just say over a yard of concrete, typically it is uh, ordered from a batch plant. And so it's going to come in a in a transit mix truck. Now, you know, of course, you're going to pay extra for that because um, they're going to charge you. A lot of them have a fuel surcharge, and you're just going to pay more. But uh, you feel, you know, good about the product, and you get a quantity that is that you don't have to worry about mixing yourself or all the mixing equipment. And I, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. The last uh, type of mixing method is actually a stationary mixer. And this would be used on uh, by contractors for projects that are actually, for, you know, when you have a lot of concrete. And so then they'll actually, it's kind of like if you think about a batch plant, um, it's kind of like saying, hey, we're going to set up our own batch plant for just for this project. The difference would be that instead of using, and I'll go ahead and just flip down to that picture, instead of using a... Um, there, instead of using a, a transit mix truck with a big, big rotating drum on it, is you could actually just discharge it into a dump truck and, um, and then just haul it a short distance and, you know, discharge it to, to your project there. So, so that would be a, a stationary mixer, one that you would set up for a large project or a large amount of concrete on a project. The uh, batching and weighing are, are very important. So um, most of your batch plants have electronically controlled, um, you know, scales. And I think I mentioned this before, if I didn't, I want to make sure it's understood that the, the water that we calculate to place in the mix uh, typically has to be adjusted because your stockpiles are generally setting outside. So they could be on the wet side or they could be on the dry side. Um, the, the saturated surface dry 
condition of a bulk specific gravity is what they would use in those calculations. So, you know, a saturated surface dry material, just like we had on the last test, is, is ideal uh, because you're not going to take uh, water from the mix itself. So it's like your aggregate has enough water, but yet it doesn't have free water. So there's not water on the outside that's going to cause too much water in the mix design. Uh, but yet at the same time, once again, it's not going to you might say suck or absorb water out of the concrete mix because the water that you calculate to go in, like we, in our calculation, is what the cement particles need for full hydration. Uh, another problem that you might have with the, as far as the mixing, is the fine aggregates of sand, typically is what's used, will, if it's wet, like say if it's outside, it'll tend to bulk on, uh, you know, and, and clump together. You know, if it didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to make a sand castle. It's called apparent cohesion. So that is a problem because sometimes we'll see if you're able to discern in concrete uh, that there are sand particles. In other words, you can actually see a bulking of sand. That's a problem. And that means they were too wet, uh, you know, when they were put in the mixture. So we don't want that to happen. So they, they carefully control, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the... Um, the coarse and fine aggregates and the things they use so that they are watching their, their free water contents and making those adjustments before they finish the mix design. Most mixing equipment has two function, functions, both mixing and agitation. Uh, like we do in the lab, we're really just mixing. But if, if you notice those uh, trucks that I showed you a picture of with the, with the rotating drums, uh, they're actually, when they're driving down the road, they're actually not mixing. They're just kind of agitating and keeping the mix from setting. And so this, they're moving really slow. And then once they get on the job site, uh, and they might add admixtures once they get to the, to the project, project site, they'll, they'll kind of crank that up and they'll, they'll mix again. So, so they start that process at the batch plan and then they'll finish it right before it's discharged. And then ASTM, I won't go over those standards, but they have um, some standards on the mixing time and, and no more than 300 total revolutions. Something that is important uh, as, a, as a standard is that it discharges before 1.5 hours after the mixing begins. That can be a problem because um, sometimes traffic could be a problem or uh, there could be a project that is already an hour away from a batch plant. And so there wouldn't be a lot of slack time in there uh, for delays. And what happens there, uh, they, call, they call those hot loads or hot mixes, is that the hydration process is already, uh, not only already begun, it's already in its later stages. And so once that concrete wants to set, um, then if you try to go back and place that concrete, then your strength is going to be compromised, your finishing operation will be compromised. So uh, it's, it's not, not an ideal situation. And that's why a lot of people uh, are, don't really know. That's why one of the things that we test for typically on a concrete project is we actually test the temperature. And so um, hydration is a chemical um, process and it, the heat of hydration will kind of give us an idea of, of whether or not, uh, once again, we had that hot load and, and how long that uh, it's been mixing. So, all right. So uh, as far as the ready mix, so I mentioned that um, primarily this is what's used on construction process. There's, there's actually three different kind of types. Most of these people don't pay a whole lot of attention to, but if it's a central mix, then, uh, you know, I said the mix is, is started at the plant for all of these, but in a central mix, it's actually completed at the plant. And then once again, this would be like um, if we set up a, a, a kind of a, a stationary mix or not a batch plant, but a, a just for a project. And then we could put it on the dump truck or uh, even a conveyor belt. I haven't seen that, but I'm sure they, that could happen depending on the project. Um, transit mix, mixing done by truck at both mixing and agitating speeds. So, you know, we talked about that. That's, that's typically what you would have on a, a project, which you call the batch plant. So the trucks, you know, starts the mixing and then he agitates for, uh, 
uh, most of the trip and then right before discharge they're going to do some some further mixing and then a, what we call a shrink mix is done at the plant uh, by the truck once again here's a picture of i won't say this is a typical um, batch plant ready mix truck because there's something a little different about this one this is actually uh, what we call a front discharge. So most of these trucks discharge out the back. Um, this one, it, it enables the driver to get a little closer to the discharge point and see that. Uh, this truck also, you can see, has some extra axles on there, so to probably haul a little bit more. Uh, federal highways and state uh, laws and regulations dictate how much they can haul. And so uh, this truck would maybe be able to haul just a little bit more. So it just depends on the job, but that's, uh, that's what you'd see with the rotating drum. Most people are familiar with those trucks. The last thing in this chapter that we'll cover is uh, just a, a generic term called shotcrete. And it's basically um, a, a flowable concrete mixture with very little to no coarse aggregate that is sprayed and placed with a high velocity. So a lot of people, I think I've got a picture of either a, a canal lining or a swimming pool, and those, those free body swimming pools. So, you know, a lot of uh, wealthy folks like those, or you see them on TV on that uh, show, Insane Pools, if you like to watch that. Uh, it can also be used to um, strengthen members maybe that are cracked or that have uh, spalling. Um, so it can be used, that can be used for tunnel linings, canal linings, those kind of things. And there's a picture, uh, the last slide there of a couple of fellas spraying that on. It's also used um, on what's called soil nailing. So that's a uh, soil stabilization procedure and sometimes you'll see those, see that on the side of the road where they kind of sprayed like a, a thin layer of really, which is concrete uh, over top of a woven wire mesh to kind of put a face on uh, a slope that's been either uh, remediated or some or, or constructed. All right, that is the end of those. Any questions there? All right. Let's see, let's go one more. I wanna go over um, testing. And we'll be uh, doing some of this. Monday, so uh, we can go ahead and go over primarily what what we'll be uh, what we'll be doing on Monday. You can can you see that testing fresh and hard and concrete? Okay. Very good. All right, so one of the most important things um, when you're talking about concrete and concrete construction is what we call workability. And that's just by definition, you can see here, the ease at which a mixture is not only mixed, transported, placed, and finished. So uh, there's a, there's a trade-off, uh, you know, a lot of times contractors, they want the concrete mixture to be very workable. Uh, so generally that means that they want it a little more fluid. They want the consistency to be more like a liquid than a solid. And it just makes them, makes it easier for them to work. Uh, and mainly we're talking about placing and finishing. But the problem with that is, uh, as, we, as we've seen in the uh, earlier slides and in, in the first set of slides that I handed out, is that the strength is inversely related to the water cement ratio. So we can't just put a bunch of water in it um, because then we're, we could be compromising the strength. So there are other things like admixtures, but that, you know, that's part of the reason why we test and have people that uh, it's a good idea to have inspectors and, and, and testers uh, testing the concrete when they're placing it. So, uh, one of the first tests that we'll do and, and talk about here is called the slump test. And that measures that fluidity of a concrete mix, mixture. So here's, here's kind of the, uh, the steps that we take. It, there's a cone, I'll show you a picture in just a second, that we're gonna fill in thirds by volume. 
So a cone, when you fill by thirds by volume, is not equal height. So you want to put a, you know, a little less, you can see two and five eighths. And then what you're going to do is rod that. And there's a certain rod that we use. It has a, it's not shown here, but it has a five eighths inch uh, tip on it, circular tip. And we're going to, we're going to take and rod that 25 times, just penetrating the first layer. And it's, that would be on the second one. So the first one is going to push all the way to the bottom. Then we put another third in, we rod it 25 times. We put the last third in, we rod it 25 times, trying to make sure we keep the cone full. And then we strike it off level across the top, lift the cone in three to seven seconds. So it's a steady lift. And then we uh, measure the slump down. So the slump test is actually a measure of how much the concrete slumps once we lift the cone. So you can see here uh, in this slide, uh, he's, he's measured down. So this cone is 12 inches. And so he's measured down. I can't tell exactly, but it looks like it's about two inches maybe or two and a quarter or something like that. So that's, the, that's a slump. That would be a low slump mix. The next picture here would be a high slump mix. So you can see this concrete is much more fluid than uh, the previous picture. You know, this one maybe is one, two, three, four, eight, nine and a half inches, something like that slump. So that would definitely be on the upper end. Specifications uh, may not allow this mix. So if you, and we'll talk about this a little more uh, Monday in lab, but if you have a specification that has a slump range of, uh, you know, five or six plus or minus one and a half or plus or minus two, and you get this, then there's nothing that, that they could really do about this uh, easily because, and a very important point is, we can't take the water out of the concrete. We can put more water in. So, you know, we'll talk about adding water and we, you need to do that very cautiously because we can always add a little more water to increase the slump, but once, once a slump gets into the high range and out of spec, really the only thing we can do is go back and add more cement. That's a possibility sometimes, uh, even for these ready mix plants, depending on how far the project is from the plant. Uh, they can go back and, and add some cement to it. But keep in mind uh, that hour and a half, so we've already started the hydration process. So sometimes they just have to, somebody has to kind of eat that load so that brings us to the next slide. Uh, and this is definitely a rule of thumb, but um, a rule of thumb says that one gallon of water raises the slump of one cubic yard of concrete by one inch. So if we made some, do some quick math there, we'll say that we had 10 cubic yards on a truck and we test the slump and we get two inches and they're wanting a slump of four inches. So how much water would you wanna add to that concrete? So 10 cubic yards, so if I added 10 gallons of water, that would raise it by one inch, that would take me to three. If I had another 10, that would take me to four, where I would want to be. So the, the answer at first seems like that we would add 20 gallons of water, but I would never add 20 gallons of water. I would always want to be on the conservative side and, and add, you know, maybe, maybe 15 gallons of water or 12 gallons of water, and then retest the slump and see where you are. It's not an exact... Um, science with with adding the water so always kind of you know use it with caution and, and kind of be conservative think twice before adding water to concrete uh, and I always say keep in mind um, when you're on a job site especially if you are on the inspection side okay if you're the third party inspector or whatever it may not be your job to tell them how much water to put in the concrete um, if you tell them to put so much water into concrete and then once again, there's too much water in it and it goes out of specification on the high side, then you may be responsible for that load. So, you know, once again, doing the math, let's say it's 170 or $80 a cubic yard and you have 10, you know, you're, you're looking at a couple thousand dollars that you might have to be responsible for. So as a, as a tester, as an inspector, sometimes it's just better for us to say, you know, hey, it's good, the slump test met, and the other tests we'll talk about, or no good, and not tell them how much water to put in. You might say it looks like it needs some water, but not, you know, be very cautious with that. 
Now, on the contracting side, or if it is your responsibility to get the mix within the right uh, tolerance or specification, then once again, this is where you would use this, but cautiously. The next test that you might see is uh, an air test. So remember, we, we put air in concrete um, typically because of the freeze thaw resistance. So it's just tiny, not gaps or voids, but microscopic, you might say, uh, air entrained in the concrete. So we need to make sure that um, there is a certain amount of air, but not too much air. So you gotta have some because we want air, but we don't want too much. So we test that. There are a couple different test uh, methods and, and, and different ways of doing this. We're, we're gonna go over two, which are, let me say by far the most common. The first one is a uh, pressure air test, and this is method or apparatus B. You'll see some similarities in this, uh, in how we do these tests. So these are filled in thirds again, okay? But this time the, the bowl, I'll go ahead and flop down there. This time the bowl here is actually a cylinder, not a cone. So a third by height is also a third by volume. So this one's easier to see. We rod it 25 times, just penetrating the previous layer. And you do that all the way to the top. And then you're going to strike it off level again. Um, now with, with this, there's going to be a rubber seal when we put the, put the top on the uh, air pot. And so you're going to have to clean off, um, you're going to have to clean off the area between the two to make the appropriate seal. So generally you do that with a sponge or a rag. So that's uh, clean the upper lip and clamp on the top portion. Once you clamp on the top here, what you're going to do is you're going to actually open these, uh, they're little water valves that are, uh, that are on both sides here, and they're, they're, they're called in the, in the notes, the, the specific name is called petcock valves, and you're going to fill with a syringe. It's a, it's a, it's a booger sucker is what it is. So, now, Tony, you may have one of those uh, little things to clean out baby's noses with. That can't feel good, by the way. But anyway, so that's what, uh, that's what we fill that with. So we force the air into one side, and you can see he's doing that here, until it comes out the other side. Then what we're going to do is we're actually going to get a little more water in the, in the syringe bulb and we're going to do that again slowly and then close off the opposite side. So what we're doing is we're making sure there's no air in the top uh, of the pot here. And then once we close off the opposite side, the water is going to, that we're pushing in slowly is going to come right back to us and we're going to close off the near side. Then we're going to pump up this piston right here into, uh, generally these things are calibrated and there's a pre-selected uh, zero, you might say. Sometimes it's not right at zero. We're going to pump this up until it reaches that pressure. And then we're going to release that with this little gold tab uh, into the, press, press the release lever and, and it forces that water in and then we get a direct reading of the air pressure on, on the gauge. And so that's kind of how the, the, the pressure test works here. Uh, he's, he's knocking this and kind of wrap or tap the sides with the hammer until we get a stabilized uh, reading. So uh, we'll do that. That's the pressure test. The volumetric test that we're going to do maybe is a little, little simpler, uh, but we, we've got the same kind of, uh, basically it's a little bit smaller, but we've got the same kind of a, a cylindrical pot that we're going to put the concrete in. Same way, three layers rotted 25 times just penetrating the previous layer. Now the difference in this is uh, we're going to clean off the top and bottom, you know, the seal between the top and bottom portion. And the, the volumetric test, what we're going to do is we're going to place water in the top of the uh, top portion here until it reaches the, the zero mark. So all of our air and trained air is down in the concrete and the top is just water. It's similar to the last method, only the last one, we're forcing the water in with pressure. In the volumetric method, we actually have to mix it. So once we get the water to the zero mark, then we're gonna take this um, apparatus, and some of these are called, they call them roll meters because uh, they actually roll them around. So you're gonna invert it and shake it, and what actually happens is the water that you put in the top then actually enters into the concrete and the level drops. If we can make a direct reading at that time, it's th then we do that. Sometimes there's a good amount of foam in the top and then we have to kind of um, 
might say dispel that with isopropyl alcohol. Um, and then we need to make that adjustment. So if we put, if we put one uh, cup, you need to put it in one cup increments of isopropyl alcohol, um, then it's gonna change the reading on the, on the calibrated neck that you see there by one. So, you know, we would, we would add that to the, what we have to get the correct reading. So in other words, if it dropped uh, from the, the top, if it dropped down to three and we added, you know, one that took it back to two, then we would need to make sure we put that back in because we couldn't get the reading because of the phone. So that one's a little more, uh, a little more direct. And we'll do that uh, test on, on Monday. So you'll get a good feel for that. Just a couple more uh, slides here. The uh, chase air indicator is just what it says. It basically, it's not an air test, but it actually gives you an idea of, or an estimate of the amount of air. Uh, this is something that's relatively small. So it looks like this. It's actually the same exact principle of the volumetric test that we just did. The only difference is instead of having the big pot, you know, that's several inches in diameter, we're working with something that's maybe uh, three quarters of an inch in diameter. And we're only putting in material that is no larger than a number 10 sieve or 0.1 millimeter. So really all you're testing here is what we would call the paste or you might even call it the mortar. It's just really the cement and water. That's really all you want. You could have some sand, I guess, but that's it. And so you kind of rod that into the cup and then you fill the opposite end with, once again, um, with the isopropyl alcohol into the graduated line. And then you just shake it up, just like we said for the volumetric test. And then you look at how far that level drops again, uh, because it has a graduated neck, just like the volumetric test. Uh, there is a, an adjustment that is made. It's, uh, it's conversion factor for mixes other than 15 cubic foot of mortar per cubic yard. So not quite as easy as far as the calculation, but in principle, it's the same thing as the volumetric test. All right, I think that's probably um, a good place to stop. It's enough information and we'll pick up there um, Monday or Wednesday with our test methods. Any questions? I thank you for uh, joining in this morning and have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. you too. See you on Monday. Thanks. See ya.